Hello and welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. I'm Indre Viscontis, your host and moderator for today's event. The Sound Health Network is led by co-directors Julene Johnson and Charles Lim, who also composed our introductory music. And music therapist Sherry Robb and I round out the leadership team. Our mission is to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and wellness. The Sound Health Network is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts with the University of California, San Francisco, and is in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming. This webinar series features interdisciplinary conversations between researchers and other stakeholders in our community, representing diverse perspectives and addressing obstacles that stand in the way of our mission. This month, we're exploring how COVID changed our relationship with music, how it decimated many musicians' incomes and livelihoods, how we turn to music for comfort and healing, and how artists and scientists have pivoted to explore and take advantage of how music affects us. Renee Fleming is one of the most acclaimed singers of our time, and we're delighted to have her join us today, along with Dr. Daniel Levitin. She's performed on the stages of the world's greatest opera houses and concert halls. She's been honored with four Grammy Awards and the U.S. National Medal of Arts. She's also sung for momentous occasions from the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony to the Diamond Jubilee for Queen Elizabeth II at Buckingham Palace. In 2014, she became the first classical artist ever to sing the Star Spangled Banner at the Super Bowl. She's given presentations with scientists and practitioners around the world on the connection of arts and health, earning Research America's Rosenfeld Award for Impact on Public Opinion. She's also a founding advisor here at the Sound Health Network and a co-chair of the Johns Hopkins Aspen Institute NeuroArts Blueprint. Dr. Daniel Levitin, Welcome, Daniel. <laughs> um, is a neuroscientist, musician, and best-selling author. His research encompasses music, the brain, health, productivity, and creativity. He's published more than 300 articles, and his TED Talk is among the most popular of all time. And his most recent book is called Successful Aging. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, Andre. Um, so I wanted to start with Renee, um, some information that you could give us about what happened at the beginning of the pandemic. Take us back to say March, 2020 or February, 2020. Um, what happened to you in particular? Wow. It's so funny because I remember this so clearly because I was singing in Charlottesville, Virginia, and my friend Ann Patchett had come to see me and we were wandering around Charlottesville with Donna Tartt, another author, and just hanging out and having a great time. But we felt sort of felt like aliens in this college town a, a little bit wandering around and looking for a nail salon and things like that. And I was just about to leave for Europe for a month long tour with the concert pianist of Kenny Kissin. So I was very uh, preoccupied with that. And suddenly we get all this news about, you know, this virus and nobody really knows what's going on. And I, I was I was I was on my way to the airport and I thought, you know what, <clears throat> I'm just going to wait. This is wait one more day. I can afford to go a day later. And sure enough, yesterday, everything was canceled. So my entire tour was canceled, you know, and for, really for the whole year, 
things for me were canceled with three month kind of blocks. Mm -hmm. And at first it was sort of wonderful. I'd never been at home for more than a few weeks. And um, after about six months, you know, I started to really worry (laughs) that that maybe I wasn't going to work anymore. You know, it's, it's, but for the business at large, it was tragic. It was really um, devastating for, for our business because so many people, not just grounded, but really didn't have the money to stay in New York, to stay, to keep their jobs. Um, they had to move back home. They had to find other, some people went and, and were trained to do other things. So, and there was no really guarantee that uh, companies were going to be able to open again because they were financially extraordinarily stressed. So yeah, it's, it's been a very rough year for our business. You know, I'm uh, as an opera singer and as a friend of lots of opera singers, I, I remember what was something that was so devastating was learning how singers are super spreaders and just feeling like not only are we not able to perform, but like we could also be a place where, you know, this thing that we love is 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 really kind of damaging to people. And I, I remember hearing about that choir rehearsal in Washington right. State, you know, yeah. Um, and just, yeah, the impact that had on, on sort of just the mental health of, of so many singers. Right. I, I agree. That was a, that was a really frightening time. So um, one of the things that you did shortly after the pandemic began and locked everything down was the Music in Mind live series. So tell us about like how that started, you know, um, Daniel was a guest there. Tell us a little bit about sort of like just what so you were did you? And how that happened. So were you? Yeah, two of one of my favorite guests. Exactly. Um, I just thought, you know, what can I? I wanted to stay productive at a certain point. So in the summer, I, I thought, why don't we try and do this? And it, of course, it's all, it's always harder than you think it's going to be. And it wasn't just the planning and the interviewing; it was the technology. It was trying to make sure the things that actually worked. And plus, when you have guests from other parts of the country. You know, everybody's technology has to work. Um, and of course, we've all become Zoom dependent, but I'd never heard of Zoom <laughs> when, yeah, when this all true. started. So it was um, it was well, a lot knew of that fun. You the record, who's Zoom and who? There, yeah, that's, there's one. There's one reference. You're right. <laughs> so, but it was, you know, we did 18 or 19 episodes. Um, it was a broad uh, group of people. And of course, when we saw this with digital performances, you can get a lot of singers that you couldn't usually get because everybody was out of work. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, to have Vivek Murthy before he was named Surgeon General and Deepak Chopra and, of course, Dr. Francis Collins, um, Zakir Hossein. We had, we had a you know, combination of musicians, scientists, healthcare providers, uh, music therapists. And, uh, and I was shocked that the audience was huge. It was almost 700,000 um hits and and it was also in 70 countries so there's clearly um an interest in this field and and a real passion for this intersection people want to understand what's happening in the brain what the therapeutic value is um how it how it feeds children and and they want to understand also what what's happening when you're listening to music and and doing something you really love so it 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 struck a chord i actually i could have kept going but of course, I thought, oh, this is going to be over now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought, well, I'm going to go back to work. This was a, that's a year ago. So more than a year ago. Yeah, I think that that's like the other thing that for a lot of people whose livelihood and just whose passions depend on being together in large spaces with lots of people, we just kept thinking that, OK, now it's good. Now's going to be the time. Now's going to be the time. I mean, I. I directed an opera this summer and I was like, it's going to be great. It's going to be the beginning of you know June. We start rehearsals. It's all outdoors. It's just going to launch this huge season. And then like literally on performance number two, there was a breakthrough infection in one of the other casts and we, sh- we were shut down. Oh. And so it was just devastating to see this like up and down. And, and I, you know, so, but you've just come back from a European tour and you're yeah, going back totally- again. <laughs> Seven countries, um, and then I went back to Paris, and I'm going back to to Europe again this weekend. I have to say they they've done it. They've really done it. Um, they just sent, you know everything was became very strict. You know you could choose not to be vaccinated, but then you wouldn't be able to go anywhere or do anything. In Paris, you cannot order a cup of coffee at an outdoor cafe without showing your vaccination card. You can't go into a store. I had to to go to a performance. I had to have that and a test. 
And wow. people are, the level of freedom there is much greater hmm. than in a lot of places in the U.S. So I applaud them, especially, I was especially surprised that in France, everyone has conformed because this is not a conformist nation. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. it, it's quite impressive. Wow, yeah. <laughs> You'd expect it in Germany, not in France. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but Germany, it's more problematic. They they're have a more politically divided um uh, citizenry. And so it's, it's Germany and Austria is tougher. Hmm. So yeah, surprising. So Daniel, you were on a book tour just before it all shut down, um, promoting successful aging. Uh, so what was, what, what happened to you? Well, I was trying something I'd never done before, which was, I was simultaneously on an interleaved book tour and a music tour with Victor Wooten. And Uh, We did some uh, five shows, Victor and I, including Yoshi's in Oakland and the House of Blues, Catalina Bar and Grill. Fabulous uh, venues. It was so much fun. And um, I launched a book in January 2020 with a a typical six week book tour like I always do. Um, And then suddenly. uh, Well, first I got COVID. Uh, I got it. I got it early on in February while I was in Edinburgh uh, in a a kind of damp, packed Scottish uh, tavern. Did you know that's what it was? No, nobody knew. People didn't know. Yeah. No, I mean, it just seemed like a flu. We only, my wife and I only found out retrospectively Mm. that it was, it was certainly COVID. Um, This is February, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So very early. Uh, you wow, know, we, yeah. we couldn't even get tested for it until April. Nobody had any tests, as you yeah, know. Yeah, that's true. Even right. UCSF, just up the street, they didn't have any. That feels like a decade ago. I know. <laughs> um, so the, the book tour, normally, because the book had hit the best, bestseller list, normally we would have extended the tour another few weeks. And Victor mm. and I were planning to go out for another 12 shows. All that got shut down. Huh. Um, and... So it was, as I think Indra was uh, explaining, and as you've experienced, and, and so many other musicians and actors, uh, dancers, you pre- people don't always realize we'll prepare for a year or more for something. You know, a book tour, um, I don't just go out and talk about a book. I prepare what I'm going to say. And, you know, I mean, it's hmm. intense preparation, like, like rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, practicing and getting everything in line to play with Victor. Uh, and then suddenly all those plans don't really come to fruition. Mm-hmm. And it takes its toll on you psychologically because mm. the the preparation isn't always the fun part. It can right. be. Right. Yeah. But it's all in the service of something that didn't happen. It's very disappointing, too. This is just a let it's a letdown. It's a severe letdown. And it's still happening. I mean, things are still being canceled even now. Yeah. For me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People, people were optimistic about the fall and so started planning things again. My friend Rodney Crowell is actually out on tour now, but I don't know that he'll be able to keep up all the dates that he has mm-hmm. uh, because COVID is uh, hmm. creeping up. And I just talked to George Rutherford yesterday, who's on top of all this from UCSF. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not to put a doubter on all of this, but he thinks this winter, this winter will be bad. Uh, uh. Um, you know, people go in in the cold, they'll, they'll relax their vigilance mm-hmm. and it'll spread again. And so we're back to thinking, well, maybe it'll be okay. Maybe it won't. And I can tell you from a neuroscientific standpoint, and, and you can corroborate this, Indri, the, the biggest stressor on the yeah. human body and on the human brain is uncertainty. Yep. Hmm. Just not knowing. So right. much so that uh, it's been given as an explanation for um, the, I guess the propensity for so many people to believe fake news or a conspiracy theory. They would rather just mm-hmm. commit to something mm-hmm. than hmm. not know. You know, yeah, that that's like, that makes know, sense. I like to think of the brain as like a predicting machine, right? Like every, almost everything the brain does is about figuring out what's going to happen so that we can prepare and act accordingly. I knew accordingly. you were going to say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> um, so when that goes awry, yeah, I think, you know, you get into this learned helplessness where you just, you know, it's very, very stressful. Anxious. Um, yeah. Anxiety. Yeah. I think the I mean, whole country is in some is experiencing some sort of low grade chronic depression. And we just haven't called it that. Everybody seems slowed down a bit mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in every respect. Tired. Yeah. 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 So tell us a little bit about the, um, I want to get to the Healing Breath Project uh, in a minute, but, but before then, I, I think actually we should talk about your um, SSHRC project. So why don't you tell us, first of all, a little bit about how this grant that you got from Canada, how it's different from some of the NIH and grants that um, people get in the U.S., and then what the study was about. Well, I'm very lucky as a dual Canadian-American citizen and spent most of my career in Canada. Um, Canada has a different granting philosophy than the U.S. In the U.S., the NIH and to a lesser extent the NSF gives out a whole bunch of money to a relatively uh, to relatively few number of people. It's sort of the star system, mm -hmm. uh, and Canada gives out substantially less money, but they spread it around. Hmm. Uh, and their philosophy is that well. We want to encourage young people to make discoveries. And just because you had one discovery doesn't necessarily mean you'll have another. And in fact, in a separate research project, I began during the COVID because I couldn't actually collect data from real people in a head scanner. I've been looking at success in music and literature and science. And it turns out that having a single success, however you measure it, does not increase your chances that you'll have another or another or another. Hmm. Even if you've had, for example, 50 hit records, that 51st hit record is just as hard to get as, you know, the first or second one. So it's like the hot hand fallacy, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly that. So um, Shirk, the social sciences, uh, uh, gave me a little bit of money to look at a data set that had been collected from 2,500 Canadians in April and, and July of 2020. Uh, some musicians, some citizens, uh, not musician, regular folks, <laughs> and um, just to understand how COVID impacted their lives, in particularly their musical lives. Yeah. So, what what happened? What did you find? Well, one of the things that uh, we found, um, independent of the music part, is that minorities uh, had extremely higher levels of worry the hmm. non-minorities throughout Canada. Is that because they were getting COVID at higher rates? Or... No, even if you control for that. So I see, and wow. And it corroborates other studies that uh, COVID has had differential impacts in many countries on minorities. Hmm. They, often because it's confounded with socioeconomic status, right. and so they don't have access to healthcare or information. They may not have a fast internet connection uh, because of socioeconomic, not racial ethnic factors, of course. Uh, women were significantly more worried. And that's if you control for socioeconomic status. Hmm. Hmm. But, or more worried or more stressed. I feel like a lot of women took on a lot of additional burdens that, you know, just increase their stress level. I see them as two sides of the same coin. Yeah. The worry leads to stress and sure. the stress leads to more worry. And um, interestingly, we found that 86% of Canadians listened to more music especially people who liked live music before the lockdown, hmm. started exploring YouTube and Spotify, um, going to virtual concerts. Uh, and from the musician perspective, the musicians in Canada suddenly lost, many of them, 100% of their income, of course. Mm -hmm. Some of right. them, you know, the lucky ones lost only 80% uh, and had to figure out ways to reach an audience. and. Um, you know, you were very generous early on in uh, in joining me to sing one of my songs, uh, which oh, it was great. It was fun. Well, it was it was it was a way for me to play to an audience. Uh, and yeah, we hadn't collaborated musically before. We'd given scientific talks before. It was just a different dimension, and it was so wonderful. And even though it was virtual, I mean, we weren't in the same room. My experience of it was was just it was a, a, a very much needed affirmation mm. and joyful experience in the midst of all that uncertainty. 
Good. I'm so glad for me, too. I mean, just making music, even if it wasn't exactly at the same time. You know, I, I do hope the technology can catch up in time for the next pandemic, whenever that is, uh, because not it's being now. able to play and make music. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. This could be called an X, but not being able to play music together because of the um, delay, you know, in, in the technology it was frustrating. So I, I hope they figure that out. You're probably you know. You're probably know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some like like Ian Howell is in particular is someone at um, I believe he's at NEC who who does a lot of like the the no latency stuff work and and he's just done phenomenal work like you know finding tools and then using them and they use them um, but there's just something I, you know the other day I just like I went to a rock concert for the first time there's just something different about being in the room and I, mm-hmm. I just don't like it's. As an as an as a musician myself, I don't know how you feel about this, Renee, but it's like it feels ten times more work to do something virtually than to get on stage and do your thing. Absolutely, I I, I really found it hard. I was very nervous because yeah. something about the camera feels judgmental to me. I can't see anybody. You can't see someone's face mm-hmm. and read how they're responding to you, and I didn't realize how completely. Um, how much I needed that and, and depend on it, being able to kind of read the room. Are well, you like that, Dan? Do you feel that? Great musicians mm-hmm. do that. And Victor taught me uh, a lot about doing that. He doesn't play the same set list every night and he mm-hmm. doesn't play the songs the same way. He's He instructs them to turn up the house lights a little so that you don't have that blinding spotlight mm-hmm. and, and he can see how the if they're moving around or not. He knows how to pace yeah. the show. Yeah. And I've had the same experience as mm-hmm. I'm sure both of you have, just giving talks virtually. Yeah. I'm used oh. to adjusting what I say, depending mm-hmm. on how many people are eye rolling or yawning when I talk, yeah. which is usually a lot. So I'm making a lot of adjustments. But, you know, when, when it's just the blank screen, you're stuck with me not being able to yeah. adapt. Yeah, it took a long time to get used to it, actually. And and I was amazed. I started having stage fright again, also because I wasn't in the groove of performing, which right. I had never left. I had simply never not performed. So it was a shock to my system to suddenly have a little digital initiative every several weeks or something. And mm-hmm. it, it didn't it's taken me a while this fall to be comfortable again. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the Healing Breath Project. And if you could walk us through, you know, kind of the insight of how that began and then, you know, what it's all about. I had the idea uh, a year ago and it took another sort of six months before we really had the time to start trying to make it happen. But which was that, you know, I, I did, you feel helpless. You saw these people who were sick. You saw, you know, uh, just the, the tragedy of, of, of and also the other things that went that went haywire last year, Black Lives Matter and Me Too and the election. And it just seemed like a very dark time. But I thought, what, what can we offer? What can we do? What can we do? And I'm thinking singers, singers, singers. Oh, we know how to breathe. We're trained to breathe. Um, and support. And we think about breath control, you know, it's, it's like swimming in that respect, but of course, you know, it's, it's not the consistency of swimming. So, Um, and I thought, well, let me try and, you know, I know how I breathe and I know everybody does it a little bit differently. And so let's, let's put together an initiative where I get call all my friends and say, can you, can you submit something really quick? Um, Your favorite breathing exercise and a stanza of a song that someone could sing along with you. And, um, and because it was Google Arts and Culture as well, it's just uh, kind of expanding at this point. You know, I'm, I've been in talks with the World Health Organization about trying to to um, amplify it, because obviously if it's not reaching the patients who need it, then it's not worth anything. You know, it has to reach the people who, even if it doesn't help their breathing, it's uplifting, it's... it's um, uh, but it should help. I mean, it should help. And now the next step would be to collect data to figure out, does it help? And if it does, how does it help? And can we add many more voices to this project that reflect other cultures and are more international? So that's sort of where we are now with it. You know, I, one of the things I love about this project is that it takes something that singers, and at least the ones in my circle, we're almost embarrassed about in the beginning, like, you know, the, the spread of aerosols that comes with breathing deeply and singing and turning it into 
healing into something that actually can help the very people, you know, that, that were affected by this disease. Um, I love that about it. I love that it like, it brought the sort of just the joy of singing back to me, at least when I, you know, and, and I know for a lot of singers too, who, who see either see the project or were a part of the project or, you know, Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Andre. I'm so happy to hear that. I, I, I do think it is a positive, no question. And and um, and actually, I, I have a there's a gentleman that I know from Chicago who is also very involved with COPD and with other pulmonary diseases and trying to make headway there. So, you know, that's another kind of point of contact mm -hmm. in, in which we can kind of perhaps, you know, collaborate to some degree. So this is what I love about this field is that the ability to connect with people is different than what I've done my whole adult life, mm -hmm. which is connecting through this. The barrier is the fourth wall is the fact that I'm on stage and the audience is over here. And this feels more personal to me and, and more creative in a, in a way. And also, of course, more vast, the breadth of what, the Sound Health Network is doing, what you're showing and presenting is, is truly extraordinary. You know, I, I think that it's true that I don't know that, I mean, we certainly, this, as a Sound Health Network, we got off the ground during the pandemic. Um, I like to think that it would have happened regardless, but I do think that there was, you know, a real push. People started to understand that there are things that when, when everything else is stripped away from you, like art is a way um, and music in, in our case is, is a way of like taking control of some of the aspects of your own health and wellness. Um, and it's, you know, it is understudied, I think. Um, and, you know, we were having a conversation earlier um, uh, about how oftentimes- We were able to go out for coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> <Yay>. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, about about how uh, musicians often influence a lot of your best scientific ideas. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, you were talking, Renee, about how uh, the work that we all, the three of us do through the Sound Health Network and other uh, mechanisms uh, is more personal and more interactive. Uh, and it's funny because in science, uh, science isn't particularly collaborative. It, uh, Not it, always. Uh, you know, the, the ideal is that it would be, but yes. It often um, isn't. And there's often pe isn't. petty jealousies mm -hmm. and there's competitions and there's uh, senses of competition. But mm -hmm. um, what I found in, in the 30 years or so that I've been studying music in the brain is that the very best ideas and the best critiques come from musicians who are not scientists, yeah. not from other scientists. Um, and just knowing you and talking to you as and, and you uh, who are really, Renee, I consider you a scientist. I mean, there's no question you know more about the science of music and health than most cognitive neuroscientists and you can articulate it uh, and I mean, it, it is a kind of a niche, but you're an expert at it. And then, you know, I keep thinking back when Bobby McFerrin or Paul Simon or Sting would come by to visit the lab and I would run them through experiments to go, well, why are you doing it this way? Mm -hmm. And it had never occurred to me that, you know, there would be another way to do it. The great insights that musicians have into what they do, not all musicians, but the, mm -hmm. the self-reflective, self-examining kind. I mean, we're also all, the, sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Andre. No, I was just going to say simply, we're all in, a, in some sort of field of inquiry. Mm -hmm. We're all kind of constantly trying to reimagine how it is that we communicate. And um, for me, it's always been about singing. And singing is so intangible, right? Yeah. I mean, Andre, it's, it's bizarre. It, we, no, we it absolutely is. It absolutely so is. control. I mean, I often imagine, you know, if, if, when aliens come, come and hear what we do, they would, they would just think, Wait, they talk to each other and they also do this thing. You know, it's I mean, just... I think that's what's so brilliant about healing breath is that I feel like singers just know about breathing in ways that, especially opera singers, I think, or people who are who sing unamplified, but any singer really knows how to control their breath in a way that you know most scientists who study breathing, I think, don't understand. No, respirologists don't get this. You know, and so like to be able to harness that to sort of help people regain 
their breath, I think it's just so, it's so great. I, I feel like it has such a, such great promise. And, oh, good. Uh, and I think right, we'll, gonna... we'll have to have a coffee and share ideas about this. Now I know yes. that I'll get inspiration from her because she's a musician. <laughs> Great. Thank yes. you. That's right. No, I, 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 um, I think the potential is, I, I want to keep exploring it, the potential. Great. Great. Um, so I'd like to let anybody who is watching us live, uh, let you know that you could in the comments in the, U, in the YouTube live stream section, you can ask questions and, um, I'll pass those along to our panelists and, and we can talk that, talk about that. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask both of you actually is how has this whole experience changed your approach to your work moving forward? So let's start with Renee, like what, you know, what changes, uh, you know, besides the healing breath project, that seems like a big one. Are there any other ways in which you approach your work that is different as a result of the pandemic? Well, that's a really interesting thought. I think, um, one of the things I'm already feeling from audiences as I tour is this hunger, hunger for, for this, for the connections that we make. So I'm much more mindful of that. I'm less sort of ho-hum, you know, this, this everyday life we go, we perform, we go to the hotel. I'm much more mindful of the gift of, of um, this connection between people um, that we lost for a period of time in, in both in isolation, but also in the division that's occurring in our country, which is so, um, extreme. And uh, it's, I'm thinking now all the time about ways, you know, how we might find each other again, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly so do you, do the you pandemic spend more time with the audience, like after a performance or like, how do you, how do you see that as, or, or just more kind you of. Know, sometimes it's programming. It's, it's mm -hmm. really thinking, what do people need now? What do they want now? They, they, I feel this, there's a, a strong, a powerful thirst for beauty. Um, and for an emotional cathartic experience. Uh, so that makes me program differently than I otherwise would. I, you know, there are times when I, it depends on where, what city I'm in. And I don't know how, if you think about this too, but where I'll, I'll be, I'll be programming for critics. Yeah. So I'm not doing that at all now. Not, mm -hmm. not at all. I'm thinking about people and their desires and needs, which is freeing in a wonderful way. Yeah. I mean, I think so often anyone, whether you're a, you know, an author of a book or, you know, a, a musician or, or anyone, you, you really, I see that you kind of, sometimes you, you program to the critics, right? You think about what, what are the, the sort of, you know, the people whose opinions really can make a big difference. Like what, how do I get them to like what it is that I'm doing? Um, and that sometimes comes at the cost of, you know, self-expression and actually doing what, what it, what is best. Cause you know, just like we all learned from watching Ratatouille, uh, the cr critics also often don't know what's best. But don't you think also too um, that the critical body is often in our heads? It's not even a real thing. It's a it's a it's a negative voice many times, and it also is accompanied with well, if everyone likes it, it can't be good. You know, it has to be very special to be good. It has to be have a small, very refined audience or taste. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, and and it's it's something that we often you know fabricate. Yeah. So this Daniel, yeah, this doesn't compete with you, does it, Dan? No, very much so, because the uh, I'm plagued by the self criticism voice all the time, and one oh, of you the are. Thing, yeah. The uh, one of the things that changed for me musically during the COVID, I was able to do some shows this summer, finally, some live shows. And I realized having come through public schools and learning to play music in a school context where um, precision and mm -hmm. technique was emphasized over emotion. After, you know, a year and a half of not playing, I just went out there and decided, you know, frack it. I'm, hmm. I'm just going to I'm going to express myself emotionally at, because now I really want to connect with an audience in that way and they want it and, you know, forget about the technique and um, actually ha having the opportunity to sing with you sort of gave me the confidence to do that. Uh, I figured you know, oh, if, good. If, if I if I can sing with Renee Fleming, I don't have to worry anymore and be so critical. <laughs> And um, on the science front, um, 
I'm also self-critical, of course. I think a healthy amount of that helps, you know, keeps us wanting to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've talked mm -hmm. before about um, Pablo Casals, uh, you know, just before he died, a journalist caught him practicing. Mm -hmm. It's a famous okay. story, right? Yes. <laughs> Maestro, why are you still practicing? You know, you, you've done everything that can be done. Well, I want to get better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the science front, though, the uh, I, I, as I was just saying, I'm, I'm self-critical there, but um, the big shift was that I could no longer put people in a brain scanner or bring them into the lab and mm -hmm. test them in person. And so, and I couldn't hold lab meetings, which is where I train young people and, and really learn more from them than they learn from me. So I assembled a virtual lab of 10 people. There were four McGill students, two high school students, a UC Berkeley student, three Minerva students, Minerva University in San Francisco, uh, plus a full-time research assistant. And we've been holding weekly meetings, sometimes twice a week uh, since June of 2020. And we're conducting research. We do it by surveys. We uh, mm -hmm. do it, uh, we, you know, a lot of, of questionnaires, surveys, listen to music, rate it while moving a slider kind of stuff, the stock and trade of what we do. Mm -hmm. And then we've been, uh, in addition, uh, doing more computational work just in the computer. Um, that study I mentioned to you where, you know, increased chances of success go down with more successes. I mean, the, the, the curve that that makes, that's all done on the computer with access to the billboard charts and the uh, scientific papers, citations lists and such. So the science has changed the way it's done, but hopefully not there. Uh, we're still asking interesting questions. Um, and of course, in this, all, all this time, you and I have been involved with this uh, NIH initiative to define what music psychology should look like for the coming decade. <laughs> I, I just have a question about your results. D does that surprise people? Yes. That success doesn't beget success necessarily? I mean, it certainly is surprising to people who are giving out a lot of grants where, you know, you essentially have to have, in a lot of cases, you have to have done the work before you can get the grant. Um, and I think that that's, I think, you know, at least in, and then that there, there have been moves to sort of try to remedy this, I think in a lot of the, um, the granting organizations, sorry, there's a moth in my office, um, that, that, you know, to try to-, to try They to, fly to the light. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, to, to try to make, the, to, uh, make it easier for, for young investigators, for people who don't have, um, you know, a full roster of, of great papers behind them to show that it's the idea that's getting funded rather than the body of work. I think that that is, a, that is a big issue, at least that I hear talking about, that a lot of scientists talk about that remains, but that the institutes understand that it's there and are, are trying to address it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I guess in music, um, it's also generational. You know, I, I had heard about the time when people listened in a very special way. They, they, they were quite loyal to their bands or their channels or their genre. And I know um, my taste was much more eclectic. And I know my children, uh, for instance, are constantly changing, constantly changing. They're not loyal to anything. So I guess that sort of idea and, and also having made so many recordings, every recording is a guess for me. It's, you know, will people like this? How many people will like this? How, how, what kind of tone will it set? Because there's no marketing in class. So there's no sort of research about, um, about what the audience wants uh, in, in classical music. So we just are always guessing. I know what they want. More Renee Fleming. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, it, it's interesting because then you think, well, once I recorded the, the, the whole, you know, the most famous repertoire, is there any point in continuing on? You know, it's, so it's, right. it's, it, it's all these interesting questions. And I learned them from Joni Mitchell, who we were just talking about, because she had a long discography that had a change in audience that she talked openly about. Well, and then she went back and recorded two double albums of her old material 
with the London Symphony Orchestra, revisiting it. I mean, you said once you've done a classic work, then what next? But Joni went back and reimagined them. And two other people I admire equally, Paul Simon and Rodney Crowell, did the same thing in the last few years. They went back over their old songs, reimagined them, re-recorded them from the perspective of, say, 30 or 40 years later, changing musical um, tastes and um, changing views on their own lives and what the songs mean. When Joni sings both sides now as a 65 year old versus as a 25 year old, it's a different song. Totally, yeah. I love them both. You know, that, that makes me, um, it brings me up this question about programming um, where, you know, during, during the pandemic, I think musicians were trying to figure out what people wanted to hear. And often there's like, you know, there, there are a lot of misconceptions out there that when people are sad, they want to hear upbeat music. When the truth is, is they, they often want to process their emotions through music. And so they want to hear more sad music that's comforting yeah. for them. Um, but I know too, it was, you know, we were trying to figure out like what kind of operas we should do as when things open up and it's, it's really hard. Do you like go with something that no one could have gotten in any streaming platform or like a new piece, like the Met just opened with this, uh, Terrence Blanchard new opera, which, you know, long overdue first black composer to be, right. you know, um, you know, um, or do you go with like the old favorites that give people comfort and nostalgia, um, I don't know the answer to that. It seemed like yeah. in the pandemic, there were trends, right? Like around Christmas time last year, there was a lot mm. of nostalgia, a lot of like people turning back in, you know, in terms of advertising. And I have a friend who's an advertising executive and, that, and he said like, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to play on people's desires to like, you know, be together and be comforted and remember. Um, and here we are in a new era where I think too, like things are changing again. Is there increased research around uh, mental health in music? Because mental health, I think, is really starting to um, become more prominent and as, as something that we all think about and, and are concerned about. Um, and I, I just wondered if, if this is something like I love what you just said about the fact that, you know, we imagine that you want to put on cheerful music. But in fact, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, for, you know, from what it seems like there, there are a lot, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, you know, this summer, the Sound Health Network, we recorded a couple of um, workshops where people can still watch them on our YouTube channel or through our website that help, uh, you know, help generate, help them write grants for some of these NIH initiatives. And I think a lot of, you know, I can't predict what the, what the study sessions uh, will want to see, but I do think that, that people are recognizing um, that that the impact of music on mental health in particular is something that um, really the pandemic has shown us and is really necessary. I know certainly at the Sound Health Network, that is a direction that we are going in in terms of our programming is thinking about how we can talk about and foster research into the mental health space. Great. I can say I'm working with a group at uh, the University of Houston and we're looking at music and pain. And I'm working with a group at UCLA uh, including Marco Iacoboni, mm. to look at music and depression, uh, mm. particularly depression that's uh, drug resistant and therapy resistant, which is a whole lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's just the, the two that I'm involved in. We're we're in a wonderful time now where a number of young people um, went into neuroscience, which wasn't a field when I was a student. You, you learn huh. biology or psychology. Now it's a field, neuroscience. It's a whole department at UCLA. Right. Where Marco is, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, the you can go into neuroscience, you can study music and neuroscience, and the people who went into it are just now, you know, assistant and associate, young assistant and young associate professors, and they've got the background to do rigorous work. And for thirty or forty years before then. Uh, until about 10 years ago, I would say, the work was not done by people with the training needed to do it for the most part. And so that there's mm -hmm. increasing interest in it and increasing ability to do the work in a way that'll stick. You know, you can discover something and know that it's not a mistake or an artifact. Mm -hmm. This is why I love the whole division of integrative medicine at the NIH, which I didn't know existed. That was a field I had never heard of too. And that amazes me that neuroscience is that new uh, as a major. 
And, and, but the integrative medicine piece, I think this acknowledgement that we're whole people, that um, there are a lot of therapies that aren't um, so specialized that can really help kind of dig into that, that nature of who we are. I mean, even the, even the, um, uh, was it the prize that was given yesterday for understanding how skin works or how touch pain works? pain and temperature. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's going to reap so many rewards. I mean, as you're, as you're looking at pain, it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's an, it's an, a poorly understood function that affects your life completely. Right. So I want to take a couple questions. Billy Bainbridge is asking, how do we, how does the panel feel about how COVID instigated the conversation again about the the, uh, the the rights of artists and other musicians regarding streaming service uh, inequity. I mean, I think that this is something that, on the one hand, the um, the thing that saved a lot of musicians was the fact that they were able to to stream. But also, you know, it's it streaming services have traditionally not been very kind to musicians. It feels like we're back to the fifties where um, black artists were getting exploited in particularly large numbers, but now it's not black artists who are being exploited uh, exclusively. It's anybody who's streaming. Mm. The the number, uh, musicians are getting a penny, not a penny on the dollar or a penny on a hundred dollars, but a penny on a thousand dollars of what they used to get for streaming income and you can't make a living on that. No. A song that's streamed 20 million times might only pay one month rent, 20 million times. No, it's, it is shocking. I mean, and, and, you know, and the, the rationales are that, oh, so many more people are listening. There's much more access. Um, and the model is upside down. Now the recordings that you make actually um, are there to accompany your touring. Mm-hmm. You're not supposed to make money recording. But, you know, what does that do for the people who've written the songs, who've produced the songs, who have, you know, played on this? I mean, it's just um, uh, my friend Maria Schneider has been fighting this for a long time. She's a great big band leader and composer. And she's, you know, she's been dutifully going to Congress every consistently to say you have to really put a stop to this. Um, You know, YouTube, they're making so much money and um, the creators and, and musicians who are on there. And she said, I, she said, I can't spend all my time taking things down. I, you know, then I can, I'm not doing what I want to do. Mm-hmm. We, we, the, the only solution I think is legislative. And I, mm-hmm. when I was on the right. board of governors of the Grammys, I met with uh, two members of Congress, Ro Khanna and uh, Adam uh, Schiff. Uh, and eventually they passed two pieces of legislation that the Grammy organization was pushing that would compensate players on recordings rather than just getting a flat fee, they would be entitled to a percentage of future revenue. Imagine that you had played, you know, the signature guitar part on, Mm -hmm. you know, a big hit song and you got your $200 and that was the end of it. The song is heard for 40 years, you know, right? not fair. And and they um, enhanced what songwriters get, but there's still a couple of pieces of legislation that are key that need to happen. And all of us need to press pressure our Congress people to enact legislation that'll be fair. And I think the reason is that playing music and writing music ought to be a profession that's protected rather than coming home after a day of like, you know, singing sandwiches at the subway shop and then trying to make your art after you're exhausted. You should Mm -hmm. be able to earn enough money from your art, not necessarily to have the billion dollars that Paul McCartney has, although I'm, I'm glad he has it, but you know, just to have a normal middle-class life. You know, I think that kind of bias too trickles down even to um, music therapists and they are a big part of um, what, what we are doing at the Sound Health Network. And I think oftentimes because music is attached to that kind of therapy, there's a sense that like, somehow it's not as valued. So it's harder to get, you know, people to pay for it or, or insure like insurance companies or, or you know, and, right. and I, I wonder if there's a part of that, that there's the sense that like, you know, if you do it for the love of it, then why should you also get paid for it? And I, I do think that ultimately this will have a huge effect on the quality uh, because people who are talented will think, well, I really love doing this, but I'm not going to be able to earn a living. Um, 
you know, I'm going to do something else. So this is what will happen ultimately, I think. Uh, and, you know, it's the same for doctors. I mean, uh, I, I'm alarmed when I see what's happening with the payment to, to doctors from insurance companies. And it's just not tenable. It's not really sustainable in terms of quality and the democracy of healthcare. Yeah. My doctor was telling me we, we had to have virtual visits, you know, during the, the lockdown. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that uh, when he codes it as a virtual visit, he gets 15% as much money as if it was live in person. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do it in person. It was impossible. And he spent the same amount of time with me. Yeah, <gasps> that's odd. That's shocking. 15%. That's shocking. Yeah. Wow. Um, so Edgar Russell asks, Renee, you have been a Sing for Hope board member. Would you recommend their daily YouTube musical performances uh, to this audience for uplifting experiences during the pandemic? I recommend anything Sing for Hope does. <laughs> uh, I love this organization. Um, they are actually they've come they've they've created a fabulous model in the pandemic, which is that you can for you can hire a performer to send a greeting card to your, uh, I did it for my mother um, yeah. on Mother's Day, I think. And, and this, is a, this is a really a working Broadway performer and you pay them uh, and it's, it's joy. It's just joy all around, all around. And, and everybody loves it. They're, they're all isolated. And so to get somebody who calls them up or FaceTimes them and has a conversation and sings a song is, is, is an extraordinary gift. The pianos, the, you know, the pianos that are painted by artists Mm -hmm. that are placed in cities that then go to um, schools and to places where there is no piano is mm -hmm. fabulous. But the daily, you know, the, I love these two women who have founded this organization and um, they've done a fabulous job. So check it out. Absolutely. Sing for hope. Um, and Penny Brill has a quick comment to you to keep in mind that winds and brass players could also be enormously helpful in dealing with um, COPD and asthma. And uh, so recommends that maybe <laughs> we use their help too. Jason and I were just talking about that. He suggested that. And I think, yeah, that's a great idea. They actually have, they have extraordinary breath control. I don't quite know how they do it. <laughs> really long phrases. And, and then circular breathing. That's another one. Yeah. So Cheryl O asks whether either of you have experienced differences in motivation or the dynamics of empathy um, during this time between classical music and free improvisation. I think maybe we could narrow that a little bit and, and talk about the difference between um, what it means to interpret a piece that was written a long time ago versus improvisation in the fly and sort of like how, whether in, during the pandemic there was one or the other that felt more um, applicable or useful or appropriate. Well, what I do is, is not basically, it's not improvisatory, but the, there is freedom in the interpretation. So the way I phrase, the way I, um, uh, the tempo I'll use, or the way I'll say words. So that's the interpretive freedom. That's all improvised because that's, I, I, some of it's worked out, but a lot of it, I'm, I'm open in the moment, I'm in the zone and that's how that happens. But I do think improvisation is extraordinary for all the reasons that Charles Lim has discussed mm -hmm. this, this um, you're, you're turning off the judgmental part of your brain in order to be free. And um, with the pieces in place, because you can't just improvise if you don't hear what it is you want to try and create. Mm -hmm. So, but that's very interesting. And motivation is another interesting question because this, the anxiety around being out of work for so long, you know, and will I still be able to sing, you know, will, will there be enough work, you know, cause I wasn't paid either for the whole year and mm. which, you know, thank goodness was okay for me, but for not for many people. So that does create, that changes your sense of motivation and what motive, what's motivating you. Um, Dan, how do you feel about that, Dan? Yeah. Well, uh, in science, we don't improvise, so uh, I'll, I'll pivot and talk about my- <laughs> Sometimes we do. I mean, you know, in the moment when you have a question that you need well, to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In lab meetings, we improvise. Well, yeah, so yeah, yeah, know. yeah. But I think I'll, science uh, is so creative. I well, think it's it is, extraordinarily creative. You're right. It, it's creative, but it's, it's more like writing a piece of music, I think, where the initial impetus is a, a spark of an idea, which of course you could see as an improvisational notion, but then you have to refine it, refine it. And uh, that is, that's a lot of craft mm. uh, or a lot of deliberation. 
But on the musical side, like you, I spent the last year and a half singing more and singing more freely hmm. and improvising either songs that I had written or songs that I wanted to learn off of YouTube or whatever. But the other thing I did was I decided once I knew the lockdown was going to last a while, I decided to become reacquainted with my first instrument, which was the piano. And I, 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 I have one, but I'm not a pianist by any stretch of the imagination, but I had played it as a kid. And so I thought, well, all right, I, I have a year now. What do I want to do? Do I want to learn to play Rachmaninoff, which I could never play before? No, I'm going to take a simple piece like Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which I think any pianist who's been playing for a year or two, you can get it under your fingers or the Chopin Prelude in E minor. They're not technically difficult, but the emotion, getting them to sound like music and to move you as the player and hopefully to move other people, that would be how I would spend my year trying to explore the feelings behind these two pieces. And I played them every day. And at one point, about six months in, my wife walked in and she said, wow, I've been hearing that for six months, but this is the first time I heard it. Hmm. Ah, that's wonderful. Oh, that's great. I know, I know several people who went to the piano in the, in, during the pandemic, musicians. It's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Craig Good is asking, he says that um, he understands how music makes us better scientists, um, which is great to hear, but he wonders, uh, and perhaps Renee, this is directed to you, in what ways does being a scientist make you a better musician? Although, you know, Daniel, you've also gone back and forth. It's not like you, you know, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a scientist. I'm a, an advocate, I would say. So what you answer, you should answer that, Dan. Yeah. Well, it's easy for me. Uh, what I learned from science was 95% um, of what we do as scientists is, is really um, not the glory moment. It's, mm. it's, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of practice, basically. Um, and I learned through studying music in the brain how much practice is required for truly great artists like the two of you to be able to do what you do. And it gave me encouragement rather than discouragement. It made me think, well, maybe I don't have to be born with it. Maybe if I work hard enough, I can get better. And so for the last 20 years, I've been much more focused and motivated to practice because I know it'll make a difference scientifically. Uh, yeah, I have to say that like for me too, understanding the neuroscience of learning and memory changed how I practice, changed my whole approach, changed how, you know, even how I, you know, do when I'm directing, do rehearsals, like just understanding the, 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 the way, the things that you have to do in order to really get the brain to show lasting change. And, you know, Renee, you've talked about how like that sort of came to you, you know, you, you had this approach, you know, relatively early on in your career where you took, you, you know, you took this almost scientific approach to how you trained your voice. And you've talked about the granularity of that. Yeah. An experimental approach, really. You try one thing out, you, you look at the results, you try another thing out. You have to embrace it. You have to embrace the time and the attention that it takes. And, you know, I, I worked with young singers this summer and, um, you know, they're all different. And some really just want to skip over that and get to the performance part and have the big personality. Mm -hmm. And you, there are very few talents that have the ability to come on the scene at 23 and be pretty much there. Most of us have to work hard. But so yeah, I, I, wanna thank, it. I wanna thank both of you uh, for spending this hour with us. And I just wanna say on behalf of the Sound Health Network, how excited we are to partner with musicians and scientists and scientist musicians, um, because I think finally this conversation is really moving in a direction that just opens up so many possibilities. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Great to see you, Dan. Great to see you, Renee. Thank you, Andre. So thank you uh, to all of you for participating in this webinar. Join us next month on November 3rd as we speak with neuroscientists, Laurel Trainer, and music therapists who are investigating how music impacts the littlest ones in our lives, babies. 
and their caregivers. Also want to let um, you know that we have a student affinity group that is forming and being led by doctoral students, Clarissa Carlson and Rebecca Menza. So you can, if you're a student, create a profile um, in the Sound Health Network directory, which is on our website, soundhealth.ucsf.edu. You can also review the recent NIH meeting series that focused on developing evidence-based music interventions for brain disorders of aging and a webinar about applying for NIH and NEA funding uh, concerning projects regarding music and health, all of, which, all of which is on our website. So to learn more and to take advantage of the resources we offer, please visit our website, soundhealth.ucsf.edu. And you can engage with us through our social media accounts at soundhealthnet on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And of course, watch archived video content on our YouTube channel. See you next month.